Hello friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and it's been a while since I have put out a video, but I am back now, it's a new year, and we are doing the Three Rivers Challenge. This is the pantry challenge that we do every January and February. So we're gonna have the first video in that series today. But while I was gone, I wanted to kind of catch you up on what we were up to. We enjoyed a lovely two week break. That's why I didn't put out any videos for you. We had Adam home from work and we just enjoyed some lovely family time. You can see we did our annual low country boil. We did a lot of family game nights and things like that. We always enjoy this last bit of time at the end of the year with Adam home. We have some fun family food traditions. Besides this low country boil that we do, we usually do an ethnic food night where we did this year kind of a smorgasbord of all different kinds of ethnic foods. We have a big snack spread on New Year's Eve with um, lots of fun, different foods that we don't normally eat in our house, some convenience foods and things from the grocery store. And then we have a board game tournament and try to stay up until the ball drops. So it was a lot of fun. Um, and it was a nice opportunity to eat some foods from the grocery store before we headed into the pantry challenge. And that's where we're at now. Now in the pantry challenge, I I'm going to show you the meals that we have throughout the week. We're going to do the first five days of the pantry challenge in this video. And you'll see that at the beginning of the challenge, sometimes the challenge is just using up some of this store-bought food that is left over from the holidays. So that's what a lot of the meals this week consist of. And then as the challenge goes on, we'll be digging more into the pantry, the depths of the pantry and the freezer. But now we are back to it. We are going to get ready now to begin the Three Rivers Challenge. I've told you as part of the challenge, we typically have a citrus delivery, a bulk citrus order that comes in the month of January. But this year, it just so happened to come early. It, became, it came before the new year. So we are very happy to have all of this citrus in the house. Most of this will be preserved for lemonade and things throughout the year but we did order some oranges and grapefruit and lemons to have for fresh eating. So you'll see a lot of that in our meals over the next couple of weeks. To get ready for this week's meals, I sat down on Sunday and I made a very thorough meal plan. I list the meals I wanna make, I list all of the prep I need to do for that day, and then I also make a list of ingredients that I need to go down and shop for in the cellar pantry. And that is what I'm showing you here. This is everything that I needed to bring up from the cellar in order to make this week's meals. You can see lots of jars. We've got some pasta to use up, some canned goods and things. And this keeps me on track. It keeps me from having to go down into the cellar every day to find things. If I make a really nice plan, it makes making all of these from scratch meals a lot more easy and convenient and saves me trips in the Ohio snow going outside and down to our cellar. I also made a really detailed inventory over the break. And as I remove things from the cellar pantry I or the freezer, I check them off on my inventory list here so that I can know everything that I have in storage throughout the entire pantry challenge. All right, so why don't we go ahead and start with our meals. We started on New Year's Eve. While everybody was busy playing some games, I snuck to the kitchen to start on some cinnamon rolls. I have three-fourths a cup of almond milk, a half a cup of sugar, one teaspoon of salt, and a half a cup of olive oil here warming up on the stove. I also had a third a cup of warm water and three teaspoons of yeast activating. I have five and a half cups of flour here and we had three eggs and we got that all mixed together and put into the Bosch mixer and we're gonna let that knead for a little bit and we are gonna make some rolls. I always like, even though my uh, mixer mixes my dough together, I do like to use my hands at the end just so I can get it to the desired consistency and actually feel what it feels like. So as I Finished kneading this, I let that dough rise for an hour and continued playing games with the children and then came back in before midnight and spread my dough out. And I decided we had eaten a lot of sugar that day and I did not want to make these rolls as sugary as a normal cinnamon roll. So I grabbed a little half pint of wild plum jelly, 
This was low sugar jelly that was canned with Pomona's pectin. And I cut up some apples and we are going to do wild plum jelly and apple rolls. And this would be a little less sugar than my typical cinnamon rolls. So I let them rise overnight in the refrigerator. Then in the next morning, I just put them in the oven. They baked on 350 in the morning and then we just served them after being glazed lightly with a little powdered sugar and vanilla. We served them with some orange slices and some scrambled eggs. And this was a really simple breakfast. We slept in a little bit because we were up so late and I was very happy to have done the work already the night before so that the morning would go a little more smoothly. And this is how I served it to the children. Then on New Year's Day, lunch just consisted of leftovers. I think everybody was pretty stuffed from the night before and the big breakfast, and so we just had snacks that were left over. For dinner, I decided to cook up some Brussels sprouts that I had in the fridge. I also boiled some potatoes down from storage in our cellar, and we smashed those up. And we served that with some ham. This ham was actually a gift from my mother for the holiday season. It was actually two honey-baked hams. And I thought this would make a great New Year's Day dinner. And then we could eat off of that ham for the rest of the week. So at the end of this day, I decided to uh, wash some eggs. You can see that we are still getting quite a lot of eggs from our chickens, which is not normal. Typically our hens take a pretty significant laying break and we have to dig into our water glassed eggs. But because I focused on production breeds this year and integrating more of those into our flock, we are still pumping out eggs at the new year, which is such a blessing, especially during a pantry challenge. So we're able to eat a lot of these in our breakfast. So here is the next morning. For breakfast I have leftover salsa and some leftover mashed potatoes and we are going to make a breakfast casserole out of this. All I do is I grease the bottom of my baking dish here and then I make a breakfast casserole out of whatever leftovers I have in the fridge. So you start by doing a base layer of starches. I've used any kind of potato, fried potatoes, hash browns, mashed potatoes. I've used rice. You could use sweet potatoes. You could even use like stale bread um, and bread slices and things, whatever kind of starch you want to put on the bottom of your breakfast casserole. This is such a great way to use up leftovers that are in your fridge and repurpose them into a new meal. Then you can just start layering other things. I have this leftover salsa here. I just need to drain out all of the juices. That salsa has a lot of veggies. It has some beans, a little bit of spice and flavorings with the cilantro and the jalapeno. So that'll be a good addition. If I had something like meat, um, I could cube some of that up or put hamburger or leftover taco meat, bacon, whatever you want to put in this. And um, it's a great way to clear the fridge. So I typically try to do a breakfast casserole during a pantry challenge at least once a week. And it really does help me stay on top of the leftovers that are accumulating in the fridge. So then I'm just going to scramble some eggs up here. Um, you could season them if you like, salt and pepper, whatever you want like that. And we're just going to pour that over the top of your base layers. And then you're going to stick it in the oven on 350 and just let it bake until the center is thoroughly cooked. And this is what that looks like. My family really loves this. And I love that it clears stuff out of the fridge. So I also sliced up. We are eating citrus with every breakfast this week. And we're also going to eat some of that leftover ham and a really simple meal didn't take me that much time to put together the family really loved it and this is what it looked like when it was plated up for the children now i'm going to take some time to do some baking i know that i'm going to need some sandwich bread for the coming week and some bread for some soups so i decided to do my 30 minute roll recipe here i've made this for you in many videos and i'll put the recipe in the description and it makes some wonderful uh, rolls here that we can slice in half and use for sandwiches. But I noticed when I was making the rolls that I am very low on yeast. 
I did not stock up on yeast before the challenge. So I needed to get out my sourdough starter here that has been neglected and sitting in the fridge for probably six months. That dark liquid on the top of the starter is called hooch. It's perfectly safe. We're just going to pour that off. You can see that my starter was in the back of the fridge and it must be a little too cold there. So there are even ice chunks in here and that is no problem. It is not going to harm the starter. We're just going to transfer the contents of the starter jar into a clean jar and we're going to reactivate this. And then when I do eventually run out of yeast, probably here in the next couple weeks, I'll have sourdough starter that I can use for my baking. So we're feeding it with a little bit of flour, adding water, and we're going to mix that around and let that sit out. It will probably take two days, maybe three days of feeding it to get it activated again and then it will be ready to use. And in next week's videos, I'll bring um, some sourdough recipes for you showing how I'm going to use this starter. So sourdough is something I used to do a lot. And then usually during the summer gardening months and the canning months, I kind of fall out of practice because it just takes a little more time than traditional yeast recipes. But now that it's winter and we're cooking very intentionally with the pantry challenge, I can get back into my sourdough baking. So we'll just set that out by the wood stove where it is warm and let that come back to life. We're doing a lot of snacking lately on fruit. You can see that baby's enjoying an orange slice. We also have the grapefruit. We also have apples. We have many bags of fresh storage apples from Adam's grandpa's orchard that are out in the garage that we've been snacking on. The next day's lunch, this is the day I'm like, I'm going to get all of the leftovers out of the fridge. I pulled some of those rolls out. We have leftover olives, some veggies. I made a little dip out of mayo and some seasoning. And that is what we had for lunch. For dinner, I thawed some chicken breasts and I grabbed a pint of home canned salsa from last summer and just poured that over the breasts to let them marinate for a while. I decided to dump the rest of that veggie tray into a pan. We're going to cook them up. I'm not putting these back into the fridge. I have some storage carrots here that I sliced up. We're going to add that. And then I ran out to the garden to see if we had any turnips. I can't believe that at this point it's January 2nd and I'm still pulling uncovered turnips out of my garden here in Ohio. It is such a blessing. We've had such a mild winter so far. So we're going to add those turnips to this veggie mix drizzle some olive oil over it, salt and pepper it, and add it to the oven to bake. We I cooked some white rice with the drippings from that chicken, and that is what we had for dinner on this particular day. There's some chicken and rice, some cooked veggies, and then Adam had asked for a lemon cake, so I whipped one up. I will share my basic cake recipe here as we're having one of our family birthdays during the month of January. And so that was a wonderful meal. We're trying to get back into eating nutritious meals after a holiday of a lot of junk food. Okay, I grabbed a pie crust that I found in the freezer that was just left over from some time and I thawed it out and put it in the bottom of a pie dish. I'm doing this the night before and it's going to be a breakfast because I know that this day, January 3rd, is our first day back to school after a very long break. And I want to have breakfast ready to go so that the morning will go more smoothly. So I chopped up leftover ham. I chopped up some green onions. And then I'm also going to um, sprinkle in some freeze-dried spinach powder just for you know some added nutrition. And we are going to get this quiche in the fridge overnight and let it kind of sit there overnight so that in the morning all I have to do is pop it into the oven and there'll be no prep work to do for breakfast. So adding that salt and pepper, scrambling our eggs, and pouring it on top. And this will make for a really easy morning. We have had almost six weeks off of school. We start our homeschool work early in August and then we go 13 or 14 straight weeks until Thanksgiving and then we take a break all the way until the new year and now we will go back to school until the end of June with just one week break in March. So um, yeah, we this morning, it was our first day back to school. We had a nice little breakfast here. Everybody was very happy with this, getting everybody fueled up to get back to the books. 
it's really hard to get back on routine when you've had such a long break from school on top of two weeks with um, dad home where we were sleeping in a little bit and kind of eating foods that we're not used to. And so it's just going to take a little time this week to get everybody back on track. And I'm so glad that I was very intentional with my meal plan because that makes meals so much easier on these really busy school days. I already know exactly what I'm going to cook. I have all of the ingredients in the um, kitchen already. I'm doing all of the prep work and things just come together smoothly without a lot of thought and um, effort on my part. So speaking of an effortless lunch, after our morning of schoolwork, I wanted to whip something together quickly for the children to eat. So I grabbed the leftover chicken breasts from last night's dinner. I'm just going to shred that chicken up. You could put it in a mixer, but I was just trying to save dishes. So I'm just mashing it with my little meat masher here. We're going to add some mayo to it. Now this chicken was already pretty spicy because it had that salsa on it. It had a lot of onion and jalapeno and different flavors. So we don't need to add much to this to make a chicken salad. I'm just adding the mayo. I am going to season it a little bit with paprika. I'll add some extra salt and pepper. And then in the end, I do add a little bit of pickled pepper juice because I feel like that just gives it a little bit of something extra. But I don't really have a chicken salad recipe. I just make it different every time depending on what I'm in the mood for. And since this chicken had salsa, that is how I made it. I also grabbed two jars of home canned pears. We're going to strain out the juice from those pears and we're going to save it. That juice will make something else delicious later on on this day. Now with our chicken salad and our pears, I just had some leftover veggies from the night before that I heated up. We have some more of those rolls and the kids can have a little chicken salad sandwich with some veggies and some pears for lunch. And they were very happy after all their schoolwork to fill their bellies with that yumminess. Now, as I mentioned, we weren't gonna waste the juice from those pears. We had about three cups of juice left over, and so I added two cups of home canned Concord grape concentrate. I'm gonna make some gummies, and since I had five cups of juice, I added to that 15 tablespoons of pastured beef gelatin. For every cup of juice, I used three tablespoons of gelatin to make my gummies, and I've made these for you many times, but I just wanted to show you this to show how we aren't wasting anything during this pantry challenge. We never waste anything here, but especially during a pantry challenge. So the juice from our canned vegetables, the broth from our canned, or I'm sorry, our, the juice from our canned fruit and the broth from our canned vegetables, all of that will go into another meal. And so in this instance, that juice became fruit gummies that I'll put in the fridge and they'll make a lovely snack on the next day for the children during school time. Now for dinner, we're gonna go ahead and make some calzones using my pizza crust here. I'm doubling this, so I put four teaspoons of yeast, two teaspoons of sugar, and two cups of warm water into my mixer and let that activate. And then to that, I added five cups of flour, four tablespoons of oil, two teaspoons of salt, and I just sprinkled in some garlic powder and oregano. Once again, we let the mixer mix all that up, and then I'm gonna finish it off by kneading it with my hands until I get the dough to the texture that I desire. We typically have pizza once a week on Wednesdays. Wednesday is our pizza night lately. I'm going to make some pizza sauce here out of just some tomato paste, some olive oil, some oregano, and some salt. I keep it really simple with my sauce. I portioned out our dough into seven individual little pizza crusts of varying sizes for the varying ages of my children. I know how much my little ones will eat versus my big ones, so I just kind of pull off a dough ball that fits that size. We flattened them out onto our baking sheets here, and we're going to make calzones. I spread the sauce over the top of them. We have banana peppers, sliced olives, green onion, garlic. We have leftover ham and some leftover summer sausage from New Year's Eve with canned mushrooms and anchovies. Yes, my children will eat <laughs> anchovies. They love them. And then I have these stamps over here because once you close the calzone, 
Um, it's hard to know whose is whose because everybody picks different toppings or fillings to put in their calzone. So I need to stamp their name into the top of it so that um, we know whose is whose. So I've shown you this before, but um, just wanted to show it this year, how we're doing it, letting the kids pick what they want, folding it up, and letting them stamp it. And like I said, we do pizza once a week, typically on Wednesdays. That is a very busy karate and gymnastics night on a typical week. And so this is a quick meal that the kids love before they go to their activities. But to change it up from just doing pizza every week. Sometimes I'll do calzones. Sometimes I'll make uh, pizza muffins. I like to kind of change it up so that they don't get bored having the same thing all the time. So as you can see, my big boys, they like a little bit of everything and they fill it up with all the goodies. We're going to get that in the oven. It's going to bake on 400 degrees for usually about 15 to 20 minutes. And we have a really easy dinner. Now, any toppings that are left over from our pizza making just kind of get put into a container and they can be added to eggs next time I scramble up some eggs or something. So this is what we do. I freeze raw apple cider every fall. I have quite a few jugs still left in the freezer. So I pulled one of those out earlier in the day and let it thaw so that we could have some apple cider with our dinner um, it's a great feel. It tastes like fall having that apple cider. It's wonderful. And so we probably still have maybe six or so gallon jugs left that we'll be working through throughout the next uh, couple of months. On to the next morning's breakfast. We just have some basic rolled oats here. I'm going to soak these the night before. We want to soak them for at least 12 hours and I'm going to squeeze in some lemon juice. You want to soak your grains with some kind of acid, whether it's lemon juice or whey or apple cider vinegar. That acid will help break down the phytic acid in the grain or the beans or the legumes and makes them easier to digest and the nutrients more bioavailable. You can see after soaking overnight, the oats have absorbed a lot of the water that also makes them cook a lot faster, which is a huge benefit as a busy mom who's trying to get food on the table for hungry children. Now what I do is I drain out all of the soaking water before I go to cook them and we're going to put new liquids in as we cook the oats in the morning. Now I like to add eggs to the oats because I feel like my kids need protein to stay full. So I usually put about one egg per child. I scramble it up and I pour it into the oats before we're going to cook it. We are also going to add some sweetener. I'm trying to limit sugar because I didn't stock up on sugar before the challenge, but I do have this peach vanilla syrup. It was a batch of jelly that failed to set back in 2022 and is just sitting on my pantry shelves. You can see beautiful little flakes of vanilla in there, lots of wonderful peach sweet flavor, and it's just wasted. So a pantry challenge is a great time to use that up with intention. And so we're gonna open that up and we're gonna add that to the mixture here and that will also add to the liquid level as it cooks this oatmeal. And then on top of that, we need to add a little bit of more fat. Many of you guys know we're a dairy-free family because my son has an anaphylactic dairy allergy. So instead of adding milk and butter, we add coconut cream. This um, adds a lot of great fat in there just kind of makes it a little creamier, adds some flavor. My children love it. So the key to adding eggs to your oatmeal is you have to constantly stir it and cook it on low, and that will keep the eggs from cooking up like you would think eggs would and keeps the texture very creamy. As you can see, you don't see any eggs in this. It's just a beautiful, creamy texture. My kids love to put frozen blueberries on top while it's still hot. It brings the temperature down of the oatmeal a little more quickly so they can eat it and also thaws the blueberries and they end up tasting like a fresh blueberry to them. They absolutely love this. Just stir it in. It was a nice warm breakfast on a very cold Ohio morning. So, all right, now we are going to move on to the next project of the day. 
My favorite lunches on school days are soups. So I canned this Southwest vegetable soup using the ball canning recipe last summer, and I absolutely love it. For me, it's perfect, but for some of my younger children, it's a little too spicy. So to it, I'm just going to add another quart of regular vegetable soup. This is just plain vegetables in tomato juice. And those two combined together should make it just the, a level of spice that my little children can tolerate. I'm also going to add a pint of tomato juice and one can of beef here. This is our homegrown beef. Our butcher uh, we'll can our beef like this for us. And in 2022, we had one entire beef heifer canned up like this and we keep it in storage. And it just makes a really convenient meal on some days where I don't want to brown up some meat. I can just pull one of those out. And so we're going to pour the broth from that meat into the pot. But I wanted to show you with the texture of this, what it looks like. Um, as that beef is canned, the fat in the meat renders into a chunk like this. I could pull this out and save this as a cooking fat, or I could just throw that into the soup and it will add a little bit of fat here to it. And my children need all the fat they can get. So we're going to throw it into the pot and then I'm going to mash that meat up. You can see the texture is like a cubed roast. And so that is wonderful if I, I want that texture, but for a soup, we don't want to have these big chunks of meat. So I'm mashing it down so that I can get it to more of like a ground meat texture before I pour it into the soup. And so this is what everything looks like before it is cooked. And why I love soups on school days is I can just set that pot on the wood stove while we're doing schoolwork and it will simmer, fill the house with lovely smells. And then when we're done doing school, everything is done. I have a fresh, warm pot of soup ready to go. And um, my children really appreciate that when they're hungry after their schoolwork. So you will see me throughout this pantry challenge. Lunches are typically either a soup or a sandwich of some kind. Now I noticed before I served it that I wanted a little more liquid. So I added one more quart of beef broth to the mix. We're going to mix that around um, because a little bit of the liquid had evaporated and I wanted to bulk it up a little bit. This is what that looked like. Yummy vegetables, yummy meat, lots of spice from that Southwestern um, veggie soup. We portioned it out into bowls here, served it with some of those 30 minute rolls and the kids were free to go back to the pot to have as many servings as they would like. And by the end of lunch, the pot was completely gone, which was always a blessing. I love not having to put leftovers back into the fridge because then I'm just going to have to figure out how to use those leftovers up later. Now it's time to start thinking about dinner. I just wanted something easy on this night, so I sliced up some sweet potatoes. I um, peeled them, sliced them. We're going to make some baked sweet potato fries. I decided to grab some salmon. This is my favorite salmon. It's Wild for Salmon brand, and I actually have a discount code for you in the video description. I'm not an affiliate. I don't receive anything from you using my code. I just have a wonderful discount for you. I am a paying customer like you, and I really appreciate the quality of this salmon. And I cut it up. I sprinkle some Old Bay seasoning, and then since we have fresh lemons in the house, I went ahead and sliced some of those, and we'll put one on top of each little piece of salmon, and as that cooks, it kind of puts some lemon flavor into the fish. And we're gonna bake that. We are also going to open a quart of home canned beets here. My kids love beets. We're gonna warm that up on the stove. And then for dinner, we'll have that delicious baked salmon, We'll have the baked sweet potato fries. We have a little bit of leftover rice from the other night for anybody who wants it, and then the canned beets. And this was really yummy. A great way to use up some stuff from the pantry and a little bit of leftovers. And I think everybody was very satisfied with the meal. Later that evening, I needed to start working on breakfast for the next day. I decided to make the children pumpkin muffins. And I can my squash in cubes and water like this. And I use butternut squash a lot of the times for my pumpkin muffins. You can substitute it just fine. But the problem with canned home canned squash is that it's very watery and that doesn't work for a lot of your recipes. So what I do is I drain 
the broth out of the squash. And I'm just going to turn this quart jar upside down with a strainer in between the two. And we're going to let this sit for about 10 minutes or so until it's done dripping liquid. We need to get that squash um, dry enough so that it will work in our typical pumpkin puree recipes. So in the meantime, I'm going to get my dry ingredients ready. We've got three cups of flour, four teaspoons of baking powder, two teaspoons of cinnamon, a teaspoon of nutmeg, a half a teaspoon of cloves, and one teaspoon of salt with one cup of sugar. I'm going to use some water glassed eggs. I'm going to try to use some of these up in my baking recipes. We need four eggs. And so um, the reason I'm using the water glassed eggs for baking is because I prefer the, I guess, fresh eggs for scrambled eggs. Sometimes when you use water glassed eggs, the yolks can break when you crack the eggshell. And so um, I just feel like they're better for baking. You always want to thoroughly wash the shells of your water glassed eggs so that none of that lime solution ends up in your food. And then as you crack each egg, just give it a little sniff and make sure nothing smells off. They should be perfectly fine. And believe me, if the eggs were bad, you would notice <laughs> when you smelled it. So um, water glassing is wonderful. I will put a link in the video description to show you everything you need to know about water glassing and why we do it. It's a great way to preserve your bounty of abundance of eggs in the spring and the summer for these times in the winter when eggs maybe aren't as uh, abundant. So by now our squash is drained. I'm just gonna put this in a bowl. We need two cups of squash, which works out about perfectly. When you drain a quart, you end up with about two cups of squash once you mash it all down. So it's so soft from the canning process that all you have to do is use a fork here. Um, you no need to get out and dirty a blender or anything like that. We just mash it down and mix it up. And we're gonna add that to our bowl along with one cup of olive oil, and then we'll have everything that we need to make our pumpkin muffins. You can see here, this is what we're working with. Now we love pumpkin muffins, and we typically just eat them plain like this, but for this day I decided to add some chocolate chips, and this is because last summer, I believe, Azure Standard was out of my typical chocolate chips, and I bought some that were made with coconut sugar, thinking, oh, well, this is great. They have less sugar in them. Um, the kids will never know. And then I went to do some baking of some chocolate chip cookies and things with them, and the kids did know. <laughs> it tasted different, and they didn't exactly love them in the chocolate chip cookies or just to eat as a plain snack as chocolate chips. So I decided I need to start using these up by hiding them in recipes where maybe they won't notice them as much. And these pumpkin muffins were a great way to do that. So we will not be buying the chocolate chips made with coconut sugar anymore um, because my kids definitely could tell a difference. But in these pumpkin muffins, they didn't notice. It just tasted like a little bit of chocolate. And um, it actually, cocoa powder is high in iron, so I'm just going to view it as a little extra nutrition for them <laughs> in the muffins. So we baked those on 350 and we ended up with two dozen muffins that were ready the night before, which was lovely because that next morning, my oldest son had to leave for work very early in the morning. He has a part-time job, so I could just grab a couple muffins for him, scramble him some eggs, and then send him off to work with a nice belly full of home-cooked food. It was another school day, and so I'm making a quick soup. I have two quarts of home canned beef stew, and then I have um, some tomato paste here. The other jar that you saw was the leftover broth from that squash that I had used the night before. Once again, just putting that on the wood stove. We're going to let that simmer until um, lunchtime while everybody's doing school. I also was working on preserving lemons. I'm juicing lemons and freezing the juice for lemonade throughout the year. I've done videos on how I do this before, and you can check those out sometime. But since I was already juicing lemons, I decided to make some lemonade for lunch. So this is one pint of lemon juice, and to that I added three-fourths a cup of sugar, and then I fill it the rest of the way with water. We don't like our lemonade super sweet. We still like it to be a little bit of sour, so those are the ratios that work for us. And 
by lunchtime, this is what our beef stew mixture kind of looked like. Added a little bit of salt and pepper, and everybody was hungry and ready to eat. By this point, we just have a few rolls left, um, enough to finish out this meal, and everybody had lemonade, their roll, and their stew. Now it is time to work on dinner. Friday nights are a big dinner for us, so we are gonna make um, a dessert. We're gonna make this lemon bar recipe, but we're gonna make it with grapefruit. So first I'm working on the crust. I have one cup of olive oil, a half a cup of sugar, two teaspoons of vanilla, a half a teaspoon of salt, and two cups of flour. And I used gluten-free one-to-one -one flour for this. This is a Sally's Baking Addiction recipe that I've adapted to make dairy-free and gluten-free for myself. We lined the baking dish with parchment paper and pressed down our um, crust in that. I'm gonna go ahead and poke it with some uh, a fork here. Our oven is preheated to 325 and we're just gonna bake that crust for about 20 minutes while we work on the filling. And my helper here was getting me one cup of grapefruit juice. As I mentioned, this is normally a lemon juice recipe, but the kids said they wanted to try it with grapefruit. So for our filling, we have two cups of sugar, six tablespoons of flour, six of our water glassed eggs, and one cup of that grapefruit juice. And looking back, I wish I would have put some zest in it, the zest of the grapefruit that would have probably added more grapefruit flavor, but it ended up tasting wonderful. Everybody said they would eat it again. It just wasn't as grapefruity as we would have liked. So once we mixed everything together, we're gonna pour it over that um, crust, that shortbread crust that we made. I have my beautiful helper, Elizabeth. She was wanting to help me in the kitchen on this day and I love it when the kids wanna help and I'm teaching her how to make lemon bars so she can take this over for me one day if she chooses. We put that back into the oven for about 25 minutes on 325 and then you're able to just kind of grab the parchment paper, pull it out and put it on a cutting board and cut it into our cute little lemon bar slices here and everybody really loved this. I like to put a little bit of powdered sugar on the top. That's how my family enjoys it. And this is what the inside of that looked like. So that is dessert, but now we need to get back to making dinner. So in my pantry, when I was doing my inventory, I found these boxes of rice pasta shells. And I bought these a long time ago. <laughs> they are still good. I had to check the back. The best buy date is coming up. So it's great that we're having this challenge to get these used up while they're still in their best buy period of time. Um, and then for the meat to fill these shells with, I grabbed a mix of pork sausage and ground beef. We're gonna go ahead and brown that up. Now, also to fill the shells, I wanna add pesto. I had thawed two of these little half pints of pesto from our garden. This is garlic scape pesto. The ingredients are garlic scapes, basil, lemon juice, and cashews. And we're just gonna put that into the meat and mix it all together and that will be what we fill our shells with. Since we're dairy-free, that pesto will kind of serve the purpose of kind of holding everything together. Now I need to make a sauce, and these are the ingredients that I am using for my sauce. So I have two quarts of home canned tomato sauce. We have oregano. This is freeze-dried spinach powder, some freeze-dried basil. This is freeze-dried tomato powder. That will help thicken up my tomato sauce a little bit. And then this can of tomatoes is something I actually inherited from my grandma's kitchen. She passed away, um, unfortunately, a little uh, over a year ago. And I inherited everything in her kitchen and just forgot about this because it isn't something that I typically buy or use. So this is the perfect opportunity to use this up in this sauce, mix all of this stuff together, and this is what we're gonna pour over the shells. So we're just gonna give it a little bit of time on the stove to thicken slightly, but I don't want it super thick over my shells. And now comes the fun part of filling our shells with the meat mixture. I'm just teaching Elizabeth how to do that. Now the reason these shells had sat in my pantry for so long is because this is a little more time intensive way to make pasta. If I'm, it's a busy night and we've had a long day, I will default to the super easy way of making pasta, which is just a 
you know, cook up some spaghetti noodles and brown some meat and add some sauce and dump it all together. This takes a little bit more time, which is why I think it's been neglected in the pantry for so long. But I love the intention of a pantry challenge. This is the point of it is to find the things that are just collecting dust in the back of the cupboards or sitting in the bottom of the freezer that are maybe going to be freezer burned if they're not used up soon. And it's an opportunity to intentionally use that stuff before it goes bad and it saves you money and it saves on food waste. That's why we do this. So now we're pouring that sauce over. You can see it's still um, not super thick and that's how we want it because as this cooks, it will thicken up as it mixes with the contents of the shells. So we're, we've got that ready to go. We're gonna put it in the oven on 350 covered and let it cook for a while. In the meantime, I took a couple of my garlic pucks that I keep in the freezer. This is pureed garlic in olive oil and we are thawing that to make garlic bread. Here is what our shells look like. I whipped up a quick loaf of bread to make garlic bread. We have our grapefruit bars and this was a really wonderful Friday night dinner. Like I said, Fridays tend to be a bigger dinner for us with a little more um, time put and effort put into the meal. This is what the garlic bread looks like. We just spread that garlic paste on it, and my kids like it that way. It's hard to make dairy-free garlic bread, and that is how we get it done. So that is it for the meals this week. I wanted to show you something else that I'm working on. We are sprouting some seeds. I started on New Year's Day. I'm putting one tablespoon of alfalfa, broccoli, radish seeds into the bottom of my jar. I never do more than two tablespoons at a time. Um, and then we fill it the rest of the way with water. This is a sprouting lid. It just has some mesh on the top so that you can drain um, the contents of your jar. We're gonna put that on top and let it soak for about 24 hours. And then we're gonna strain out all of the water, leave the seeds behind, rinse them, put it in a bowl like this at an angle. And you can see after just, I think this was about 36 hours, we already have sprouts in there. We will continue to twice or three times a day, rinse the contents of the jar, put it back in a windowsill at an angle like this, and let it continue to grow. And after four to five days, we end up with wonderful sprouts that we can use to garnish things like tacos and um, sandwiches. This right here is on day four. We're gonna give it one more day to grow and then I'll show you how I'm gonna use these sprouts next week. We'll be back with more meals next week. I hope you enjoyed this peek into the first five days of the pantry challenge. We are gonna have so much fun over the next couple months. Make sure you check out the hashtag to see everybody else who's participating. See you next week, friends.